All right, thank you, Jackie. And good morning, everybody. A great big thank you to all of, us, all of you that could join us today, and I hope you're all healthy and well. Um, it's my great pleasure to kick off our very first BTC webinar, and you're all a part of BTC history today. So this is a new way for us to connect with each other, and I'm very grateful for all of your support and your continued support as we work through surviving this pandemic together. Today, we're going to help you learn how you can improve biodiversity and wildlife habitat in your own backyard through the protection of planting native plants and the identification and management of invasive species. It's important to think of our biosphere in a more fulsome way, and by making just a few changes in your backyard habitats, together we can make a difference to help protect biodiversity along the escarpment. So today, I have the great pleasure of introducing our panelists. And first, we have Lindsay Wilkerson. Lindsay's the BTC Landowner Stewardship, uh, Stewardship Coordinator and has worked with the BTC for four and a half years. Lindsay holds a Bachelor's of Science in Geography and Earth Sciences, and she also has a postgrad degree in Ecosystem Restoration. Lindsay has a personal passion for gardening and increasing wildlife habitat in her own backyard. Lindsay's passionate about our mission, her work, and brings great energy to all she does. Welcome, Lindsay. Uh, and Thanks, we also Michael. have Brian Popelier with us. Brian's a senior ecologist and land stewardship coordinator and has worked in ecological and environmental fields since 2009, focusing on the Niagara Escarpment in Manitoulin Island. Brian's experience encompasses authoring and leading property management plans, species at risk surveys, breeding bird surveys, frog call surveys, butternut health assessments, ecological restoration plans, invasive species management plans, and peer reviews of environmental reports. His extensive field skills include identification of both flora and fauna, and he's qualified to undertake ecological land classification and wetland evaluations. Brian is also skilled at using GIS systems for biological data collection, mapping, and cartography. Brian holds a Bachelor's of Science from, in Environmental uh, Science and Biology from Trent University, as well as certificates in ecological land classification, bird and plant identification, butternut assessment, pesticide, forestry license, and Ontario wetland evaluation. Brian can often be found in the forests and watersheds of Ontario, hiking, fishing, um, taking great pictures, and camping, and simply loves just the beauty of nature. So welcome, Brian. So um, we've got some really talented panelists, obviously, and really uh, deep and rich BTC talented staff. So I'll turn it over to the panelists and enjoy the webinar today. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Michael, for that lovely introduction. As Michael mentioned, my name is Lindsay, and Brian and I will be co-hosting today's webinar. Thank you to everybody for joining us on this lovely, sunny, but chilly Thursday morning. We're happy to have you all on board. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of connecting islands of conservation, what that means, and creating habitat in your own backyard. So as many of you know, the BTC has over 200 properties that span 11, 000, over 11,000 acres of land. So we often refer to these as little islands of conservation. So our land stewardship department, which includes Brian, works on improving habitat in these areas, removing invasive species and so on. Now, each of these is not necessarily connected to the next one. So in between, we also have conservation areas and national parks. And we also have a whole slew of private landowners who allow us to cross their land. And together, we are working to create a connected ribbon of wilderness. Now, we aren't just connecting this ribbon of wilderness along the 900 kilometers of Bruce Trail. We also want to connect a green space for wildlife as a corridor. So how can you help with this? And that's in your very own backyard. You don't have to live right along the Bruce Trail to be able to improve habitat and biodiversity in your area. If you have anything from a small garden planter on a balcony all the way to uh, you know, a regular size yard to a couple of acres in the back 40, all of these are able to help improve biodiversity in your own area. So we're gonna hopefully in, increase your knowledge of what you can do in your own space to improve biodiversity today. So what is wildlife friendly gardening? The basics of it is offering food, water, and shelter for wildlife. That's the real bare bones minimum here. So 
through the pictures, you can see a variety of things. We've got a hummingbird that's going after nectar. We've got some snags that have provided some habitat for whatever creature, I'm not actually sure. We've got some nests. We've got a great wildflower field that would provide cover for different birds. It also provides different seeds and habitat for insects as well as pollinators. We've got a cedar waxwing enjoying some berries. And we've got a little water dish here that uh, any backyard person can put together to help promote a uh, wildlife friendly water dish in their backyard. So that's just some of the basics of what wildlife friendly gardening is, is just increasing the habitat and the food and water available to the wildlife in the area. What are some of the things that we want to consider when we're creating a backyard habitat? Really, the first question to ask is, what sort of wildlife do you want to attract? If you're more interested in seeing a butterfly in your backyard or you know, a raccoon or a rabbit, then we're gonna gear what you're looking to put in your backyard to creating a, the proper habitat. So what does this wildlife eat? Where does it normally live? And how can we recreate that in your space? On that note, how much space are you willing to offer? You may have a large yard, but you're not willing to sacrifice the whole yard to a, a native wildflower garden or you may have a very large space and it's just a bit too much to be able to take on all at once. So start with a small space that's reasonable for you and work up from there. Other things to consider is how much sun or shade or water does it receive? Obviously, as we all are coming from different areas here, my backyard in Stony Creek is gonna be a little bit different from somebody's backyard in Owen Sound on what the temperature is and how much precipitation we receive annually. So we wanna plant according to the best native plants for our area. Lastly, how much time are you prepared to put in? Some of us may have a lot of time to be able to devote to a backyard garden, especially right at this exact point in time. And others may just want to be a bit more hands off and consider the garden all set once they've made their five plants for the year. But these are all questions that you'd have to answer on your own accord to be able to get the process started. So let's talk a bit about the plan. So first off, set a boundary or a general area for your garden. Now, it could be, again, big or small, but have an idea of the space that you want to work within. Remove invasive species. This is a big task for some and almost a non-existent task for others because for my own personal backyard, I have a lot of buckthorn, um, so removing invasive species is a big, big task for me, uh, but my previous yard was just uh, a grass backyard, so there was nothing really to, to take out of that space. If you remove the invasive species, what that does is it allows more space for your natives to come in and it makes sure that the invasive species don't outcompete any of the native species that you're putting in. So we're talking about selecting the native plants. You want to make sure that what you're picking is the best for your backyard. But hold on a second. How do I know what's invasive in my backyard and how to get rid of it? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Brian for a little bit. Brian's going to talk about some common things that you might be able to purchase at a garden center still that may sort of run away into natural areas in your, in your neighborhood and also a couple of other common invasives that we find out on the trail. Brian? Good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you're happy and well. Um, so the first thing is, is, what is an invasive species? So an invasive species is a, is a plant or animal or fungus or whatever that's not native to Ontario. Um, and they basically, they basically outcompete our native species and cr create a type of monoculture where, where they're the only things that, that, will, that will grow. Um, so we're going to go through a few of them here. So we got some common ones here. Lily of the Valley, um, it's, it's got really pretty white bell-like flowers. A lot of these invasive species um, came here because people wanted to, to put them in their gardens because invasive species a lot of times are cultivated. So that means they're bigger, they're prettier, um, and um, 
they're, they're very, very hardy. So that's why people put them in their gardens. Um, so th there's the picture of Lily of the Valley, little white bell flowers, and it's got big, uh, long elliptical leaves. You got gout weed, which is a, a really um, invasive ground cover. It, it, it really takes over if, if you plant this. Um, even when you plant it in your garden, you got to do a lot of work to make sure it's contained because it'll, it'll just take over the whole garden. You got your periwinkle, um, really pretty uh, purple flowers. Once again, it, it's a ground cover. Um, it has really shiny elliptical leaves as well. And then we got, <clears throat> excuse me, English ivy, um, which is a vine. And if you're, uh, if you've ever seen English ivy, it, it can, it not only takes over the ground, it'll take over your fence, it'll take over your house. Um, it just grows everywhere. It grows up trees, um, and it really, really smothers, um, it smothers everything. And then we'll go on to some other common invasives. So. These four that you see in front of you, these are the ones that, um, as an ecologist with the Bruce Trail, we really focus on um, getting rid of these because these are the common ones that we often see in our forests, uh, on our BTC properties, in our wetlands, um, along our rivers. So um, these are the ones that we, under land stewardship, we focus on getting, getting rid of these. So we'll start with garlic mustard. So garlic mustard it has, I call it scallop shaped leaves. Um, it's, it's a biennial. So it, it, the first year it grows, you'll see just a patch of these leaves and it doesn't flower. So what it, it flowers in its second year um, and the flowers are white um, with four petals. Uh, your your typ typical mustard looking plant, um, really horrible plant. <laughs> Um, all invasives, um, I don't like them. So uh, they, it's very important to control these. So we already had a bunch of questions sent in. So um, as you can see on the screen, basically people are asking, how, how do I control garlic mustard? Well, the, the best way to control garlic mustard is to pull it. You have to pull it and you have to make sure you pull, pull all the roots out. Just snapping off the plant um, at the ground isn't going to do the trick because it'll just regrow from from the roots. So you you hand pull it all out. You got to put it in a bag. I recommend a, like a black plastic garbage bag because um, what what that does when you leave that out in the sun for two weeks, it basically cooks the plant and it cooks the seeds. So um, it doesn't make the seed viable. Um, and it's, it's always important with any invasive species that. Uh, you got to pull the plant prior to it going to seed. Um, because if you pull a garlic mustard plant and throw it on the ground, even when the, like the seeds look really young, they can actually still mature and, and they can um, produce seed that way. So yeah, the one question is, um, <laughs> we, we hear this a lot. Like what's, I, I keep pulling this stuff and it keeps coming back year after year. Like, so is it, is it useless to do invasive species control? Uh, my answer is no. Um, persistence is, is key. Um, some of these, these invasive species, you have to keep at it for years. Um, garlic mustard seeds can stay viable in the soil for up to six to seven years. So uh, even though you pull a patch, you think it's gone, um, the next year it'll come back. But if you keep pulling it, guess what, that patch is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So eventually you can win the battle. And uh, I speak from experience. Um, I, I've seen it happen. We've been working on properties for 10 years now, and we've, we've eradicated some, like, a lot of invasive species. So we'll go to the next bad boy. And this one's a buckthorn. So this is a, it's a shrub. Um, so they call it buckthorn because on the tip of each little branch, there's a little thorn between the buds. Um, so it, it's, it has sub-opposite uh, leafing, so which means the leaves are just offset a little bit from each other. And if you can, you can see in the picture, it's got black berries, kind of pur purplish black berries. Um, when you see one of these shrubs in, in, 
in that has the berries, you really understand why it's why it's an invasive plant. Um, the leaves are elliptical, and uh, they have veins that kind of go parallel to the to the mid vein, which is the center vein. <laughs> Buckthorn also has lenticels, which means it has little tiny dots on the bark. So um, once you once you get to know these plants, you 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 can't help but see them. When you're going for a hike, you, you'll you'll notice them, and you'll uh, you'll want to do something about it. You want to pull them out, or cut them down, or whatever. So, so what's the best way to reduce or eliminate buckthorn? Well, at the BTC under our land stewardship program, we we do a lot of buckthorn eradication. So the small ones can be pulled from the ground. You can either use your hands. You just wrap your your arm around the stem and pull, but uh, as they get bigger, sometimes you need um, tools to do that. So we use what's called, uh, um, it's, it's like an orange pulley uh, thing that we, so we basically grab the, the stump of the, of the shrub and you push down toward the ground and it actually rips the shrub right out from the ground. So it's, uh, they're really fun to use. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers that help us out and uh, we always have a great time. You have a, a real sense of pleasure when you, when you take care of invasive species. Um, so under, some of the larger ones, because a buckthorn can actually become a small tree, and there's no way you, you're going to pull that out. So uh, sometimes we, we have to use chainsaws, and then we, we treat just the stump with, with a little bit of pesticide. Um, that's how we do it, because we're doing large amounts of, of, uh, of buckthorn. But uh, if you have one or two in, in your yard, you can just cover the the stump with a tin can or a black plastic bag, and that'll prevent it from re, um, reshooting up. We'll go on to the next one, which is dog strangling vine. So dog strangling vine, it's a horrible, horrible plant. It doesn't actually strangle dogs, um, so don't be scared if you have it in your yard. Um, so how do I identify it? So it's actually part of the milkweed family. So dog strangling vine is, is a, is a, has a double evil because it takes over um, from other native plants, but the monarch butterfly also lays its eggs on dog strangling vine um, because it is in the milkweed family. And when the larvae hatch, they starve to death because they can't actually eat the plant because um, they're dependent on the native milkweed plant. So as you, as you can see in the picture, um, dog strangling vine, it's got opposite shiny leaves. Um, when it goes to seed, you can see those pods, which are filled with uh, filled with hundreds of seeds, and they're spread by the wind. They have little little fuzz on the end of it, just just like a milkweed. And so when it gets windy, you'll see millions of these seeds floating through the air. So that's what makes it really easy, easily spread and invasive. Um, so the best way to control dog strangling vine is once again you either pull pull it out. You, you can cut it, but then you have to cover it. So um, you take a big tarp. If you have a big patch or even a small patch, you can uh, you can cover the whole population and uh, make sure the tarp is, is firmly set down. And it's better to use a black tarp because that way the sun will actually, um, it, it'll bake the plant and it'll essentially kill it. But once again, um, next year, it'll pop back up. So you got to keep keep treating it, keep doing it, but eventually you, you're going to win the battle. And then, so their last invasive that I'm going to talk about is uh, this. This is a really bad plant. So this is giant hogweed. I'm pretty sure everyone's heard about giant hogweed because of, of its health effects on, on, on humans. Um, it, it's a giant, giant plant. Um, they don't call it giant hogweed for nothing. Uh, it does resemble some native species, such as uh, cow parsnip. Um, it, it's part of the carrot family, so it, it's like a giant um, species of Queen Anne's lace, if, if you know what Queen Anne's lace is. Um, so it has these really huge lobed um, leaves and these giant umbrals of white flowers. So as you can see in the picture, um, they kind of resemble like a little parasol or, or umbrella. Um, but you, you really can't mistake this plant um, when, in, when it's in its full stature. 
the, the other telltang, uh, telltang telling um, identification sign is um, it has red splotches on the stem. So if you see a, a big plant that has big white flowers on it um, and it has purple splotches on, on the stem, then it's giant hogweed. So um, it's obviously it's not native to Ontario. Um, so we had a question about how does it become, how does it spread so far? So what happens is, you know, it's sold in nurseries. I mean, it was, believe it or not, it was sold in nurseries for uh, back in the 50s and 60s. So people plant it, and it just produces a crazy amount of seed. Um, birds eat that seed. Uh, mammals eat that seed. And then, of course, when they're uh, flying away and they're, they're pooping out, what, guess what they're pooping out? The, the seeds from, uh, you know, giant hogweed or any other invasive species. So how do you get rid of giant hogweed? Well, the best thing to do is to hire a professional because the, the, the sap of this plant, if it gets on your skin, it can actually react with the sun and give you burns. So it's a, it's a bad plant. If you get the sap in your eyes, you can actually go blind. So if you have this stuff in your yard, um, don't touch it. Just hire a professional to take care of it. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I learned something myself actually there. I, I forgot that the giant hogweed has those red marks down the side of the, the stem with a very bristly looking stem. I've been around it once before um, and I can actually, I'm, I'm five foot five and I could stand underneath the, those parasol like flowers, that's how tall it is. It averages about six feet tall, I believe, uh, when, it's, when it's fully grown. So it's very hard to mistake for anything else. Uh, so we've, we've talked a little bit about uh, some common stuff that you might find in a garden nursery and you might find in your own backyard currently. And we've sort of said why they're not the best to grow. So what can we actually grow then? And that really depends on where you live. Uh, you want to grow native to your area if possible and to your own specifications in your yard depending on the sun, et cetera, that you receive. So I've listed a few things here about uh, some questions we got uh, that seem to pop up the most. So we've got periwinkle, lily of the valley, goutweed, English ivy, daylily, and winged euonymus, also known sometimes as burning bush. And instead of the periwinkle, we suggest trying wild geranium. So there's a photo there of the wild geranium and the wild geranium looks a lot like the periwinkle. So it has that lovely purplish color. So it's got a similar flower. It grows in the shade, but it is great nectar for hummingbirds. Instead of lily of the valley, which can form a monoculture, try starry Solomon seal. This also grows in the shade. It has clusters of white flowers. It is colony forming, uh, just like the lily of the valley. So if you are planting this, keep it in an area that you're either letting it grow a little bit further than its, its bounds or understand you may need to maintain it, but it is still better for wildlife than lily of the valley. For the gout weed, we suggest the large leaved aster. And my aster ID is awful, but I know Brian's is, is amazing. Um, but the large-leaved aster is one of the very first asters to bloom. So that's great for the pollinators. It has white, violet, or lavender flowers. And it's tolerant of a wide variety of light and shade conditions, as well as soil conditions. For the English ivy, there is not a single North American animal that uses this for food. So it has zero competition in North America. And when Brian speaks about it taking over, it really does. It, it looks great when it climbs up the side of a house, but there is zero benefit to having English ivy in your yard. Now the Canada anemone is not, uh, it's not a vine, but it is ground cover and it's great for pollinators. It has a white flower and it's gonna be a lot more beneficial for uh, the wildlife in your area than something that has zero uh, edible factor. Now we've got a daylily here and now daylilies isn't something I, I generally think of as an invasive species, 
But when we're talking about adding habitat and uh, improving wildlife uh, habitat in your backyard, try a Michigan lily instead of the day lily. Obviously, it's a very, very similar look, but the Michigan lily is great for swallowtail butterflies and ruby-throated hummingbirds as well. And you can see a picture of that on the lower left side there. Now, instead of the winged euonymus, which has a lovely fall color or the burn, the, where the burning bush idea comes from, I suggest a service berry. So in Ontario, Southern Ontario, Downy, Smooth, or Canada service berry are all brilliant in the fall. Plus their berries actually are highly prized for wildlife as well as people. So if you can get to them before the animals do, uh, very, very tasty. It has showy white flowers and that same beautiful fall color as well. Some other great options that uh, are, are really easy to access are the Black Eyed Susan, uh, Maple Leaf Viburnum, Nanny Berry, Red Osier Dogwood, Service Berries, and the Spice Bush. And each one of these has its own benefit, has its own growing conditions, and I'd be happy to uh, point you in the right direction for where to get more information on these if you're interested. Some things to consider. If you're looking at planting these in your backyard and you're looking to increase wildlife habitat, consider different flower shapes and sizes, the bloom times from spring to fall, and understanding that there are different food sources. So pollen, seeds, nuts, and fruit, those are all different varieties of food for different species that you might find in your backyard. For habitat, you want to consider cover from the elements, protection from predators, and nesting and resting spots. This means probably a variety of types, heights, and sizes. So trees, shrubs, and tall grasses all have their own distinct advantages for different species. And then thinking less visually appealing, but still just as beneficial are things like snags, which are uh, dead trees that have uh, still been left standing, obviously left safely standing, and the different wildlife will find a way to create that into habitat or purchase for them. Uh, leaf litter on the ground. In the fall, don't rake up all those leaves, leave them on the ground. The bugs and the critters love to overwinter underneath these, and that helps to provide food up the food chain as spring comes into play. Stone piles and brush piles are also habitat features, and this might be as easy as when you're removing some of those invasive species, stack a few of the, the cut shrubs into a corner and just allow wildlife to uh, make that their home. I currently have a very large pile of brush in my backyard, and I found an eastern cottontail uh, popping out the day before Easter, so that was an extra nice surprise to, uh, to have that visitor. Now, most importantly is to choose regionally native plants wherever possible. This may not always be possible, but if you can find something that is regionally native, that is going to be your best option. But why? Native plants are ones that are found in your region and have been there for however long, but they've evolved with the local species and each of the species understands what it needs from the local flowers and trees and shrubs to get its the habitat and the food that it needs. And things like hummingbirds, bees, butterflies, moths and bats, they've all adapted to these species over millennia to, to be able to support each other. Native plants also support a greater diversity and number of wildlife throughout the food chain. So not just thinking of the bald eagle at the top, but all the way down to the insects at the bottom that hummingbirds uh, may like a specific nectar and another bird likes a specific ladybug that feeds off of a native plant. So these are all things to consider that native plants do support a much, much greater uh, variety of, of wildlife throughout the food chain. Native species are also generally lower maintenance because they are adapted to your environment. And this means less watering because they're used to the, the water conditions in your area. It also generally means that they're going to be self-sufficient. So everything that we've mentioned either is 
uh, a perennial and it's going to come back for you year after year or it may self seed and if you allow the seed heads to fall to the ground the next spring those will have overwintered in your garden and you'll find those popping up the next year without having to go to the local garden nursery and purchase those plants all over again. Speaking of the local garden nursery, uh, a few tips for buyer beware. Just because it's native doesn't mean it won't take over. Native plants can still sucker, they can still be colony forming. Uh, one of the greatest things for this is uh, the sumac and they do tend to spread suckers and they will grow outside of the the garden range but they're easy enough to maintain as long as you trim it back or you can mow it back and keep it within uh, a reasonable area but the good thing is is that if it does escape your your area and end up in a naturalized area these are things that are still beneficial for wildlife it just is something to consider when you're planting in your garden. Ask the local garden nursery uh, what its spreading capability is before you plant it. Not all garden centers are created equal. Many garden centers still focus on selling plants that are pretty and that uh, are easy to maintain. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Non-native plants can be great they're just not as beneficial to our local species native is obviously better just make sure you're avoiding buying invasive species so that if something escapes your garden it's not impacting the local natural areas ornamental or showy plants may look great but they're not as beneficial i did mention this a little bit and over the years, certain plants have been bred to have a bigger flower or a brighter bloom, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the pollen that's in that flower is still just as good. Uh, a great example of that is wild strawberry. Wild strawberry has a very small little uh, berry on it, uh, but the nectar and the pollen is far better for bees uh, and, and birds than it is from a uh, cultivated strawberry plant that we think of where we get that nice big juicy plump strawberry. So just consider that uh, if you're looking to have something in your backyard, try and go as native as possible and avoid plants that are grown with neonicotinoids as these are detrimental to pollinators. This has received a lot of news uh, over the last few years and a lot of controversy. Um, I know Home Depot does sell a few plants that specifically say on it uh, grown uh, without neonics, but there are many that are still grown because it helps to prevent the seed from getting eaten um, or the plant from getting destroyed by aphids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but try where possible to plant, pl uh, plant items that have been grown pesticide free and without neonics. Uh, my last bit of warning is towards generic wildflower seed packets uh, that are widely distributed because these may contain plants that are actually invasive to your area. Um, a few years ago, the Bruce Trail uh, hosted uh, on Bruce Trail Day, we gave out seed packets and they were filled with native seeds that we handpicked one by one to make sure that they were okay to be planted up and down the Bruce Trail and that they were native to southern Ontario and that they were going to be beneficial for wildlife. Now not all seed packets are done this way and you might have a generic seed packet available at Walmart that says wildflower mix but if you look closely at the plants that are actually included in the back some of those may be invasive to your area and some may not grow at all because the soil or the the conditions are just not suitable. So buyer beware and try and find a local garden nursery that has maybe a smaller scale uh, wildflower seed mix for you to choose from. But these are still great to be able to start your garden from seed and to have a wide variety of uh, plants that are pollinator friendly. So I wanted to walk you guys through a quick case study and it's actually my house. Uh, so back in the fall, I purchased a property in Stony Creek and uh, 
as I mentioned, our, our last house just had a small, small backyard to it. And this time around, we've got a bigger yard. And as you can see on the picture on the left hand side, uh, we've got a great big, unfortunately dead ash tree. The Emerald Ash Borer took, uh, took that one a few years ago. And we've got a bunch of Manitoba maples. There's a Freeman maple in the back corner there. Um, we've got some alive and some dead cedar trees. And then along the right side is predominantly buckthorn and Manitoba maple. So a few weeks ago before we went under quarantine, I had a couple of guys come out with chainsaws, take down the dead trees for me and also remove the buckthorn uh, because they've been well established for 30, 40 years and it was gonna be far more than I could, I could manage. <clears throat> now, I did remove the invasive shrubs with the buckthorn but I did leave many of the Manitoba maples. And the reason for that is they are still beneficial in some ways. So I've, I've thrown up a picture here of the pollinator uh, friendly seeds. And uh, this is something that is currently happening in my backyard right now. So if I went outside right now, I could probably see different insects uh, on the buds of the tree and they are making use of one of the first available food sources to them, which is the buds from the trees. The Freeman maple has the same thing. And I've left some of these Manitoba maples to allow pollinators to have some access to food while I, the native species that I've planted have some space to grow in to fill in the gaps and I'll slowly thin out those Manitoba maples over time. I'm big on vegetable gardening and uh, my last house I didn't have a wildflower garden so this is new for me to be able to create this space. Um, but what I've done here is you can see the photo I've put up. There is an area that I've designated this will be my vegetable garden. In behind you can see the Manitoba maples. These are going to allow a little bit of privacy for between myself and the neighbors as I plant more native things and I've got uh, some old leftover plywood on the ground and that's part of the pull it cut it cover it. I went through and dug out as much as I could of anything that was invasive in that area and then put down the boards in the fall and now when I lift those boards up the majority of the items that are underneath there are actually uh, dead or will be much easier to remove over time. So as I go in and plant my vegetable garden in here this is the space I'm working with. The one on the right is going to be my wildflower space and I'm really, really excited about this. What I've done is taken one of the larger tree limbs from the dead ash and that's what I've used to set up as a border for my, my garden in the back. It's not a very big area, I'm starting small and I'm hoping that by starting in this, this corner here, I can sort of expand around the edges over time but it's going to be a manageable space for me. Now there's in these, uh, in this little plot of land, you can see some of the uh, tree stumps that I've thrown in. I noticed that I, I do have a little bit, I don't know if you guys can see that, I, I do have a little bit of goldenrod in there and I did notice that there were birds that were perching on that uh, over the winter time. So I've left that standing as the new goldenrod comes in great they'll have a new space uh, for the birds to perch and uh, right back in the fall we actually had a cooper's hawk that landed on that big limb that we've got in the backyard and proceeded to have his lunch on that that big log so i'm hoping that this is another habitat feature and it's harder to see in the photo but i've left the leaf litter on the ground again for those pollinators that are overwintering and also included pieces of broken bark from that dead ash tree and flip those upside down. Now it's a pipe dream probably, but I'm hoping that uh, as time goes on, I may be able to find some salamanders in my backyard. Not something I've ever been able to, to do, but uh, I'd love to be able to create that habitat. So that's one of the, the species that I'm focusing on is uh, creating salamander habitat in the yard. I do have a swampy area to the right of this and uh, pipe dream again, might be creating uh, a, a vernal pool over time. So in here, I've got a mix of different things that I threw down in the fall. And uh, 
what I would suggest is starting small, pick a few of your favorites. And I have about 25 different things that I would love to be able to put into my backyard right off the bat, uh, sort of my dream list. Uh, but I do have to understand that I only have so much time to plant. So the things that I've picked this year are a tulip tree. Um, some of you may know we planted a tulip tree uh, at Fisher's Pond and I purchased the smaller version of that at the same time and planted that at the same time in my own backyard. So I have a little piece of Bruce Trail history on my own accord in, uh, in my backyard. And I've also got some nanny berry, I've got service berry, and I'm trying to think of what the last one was that I planted, uh, nine bark in my backyard just now. Uh, so they're just starting to, to develop, but I'm hoping that these will be uh, lovely showy flowers and also some great tasty berries for myself and wildlife. So we've got some witch hazel here. I picked this for the color and also for the scent. And some of the other items that I've put into the backyard are, I've got dense blazing star, I've got butterfly weed, and then a mix of purple coneflower, milkweed, black-eyed Susan, and a few other things thrown into the back corner. I raked those in back in the fall and hopefully they've had a chance to cold stratify over the winter time and they'll pop up starting soon. And perhaps later on this year, I'll be able to do uh, another webinar to show you guys what it's starting to look like. Some of the resources that I used in creating uh, the space in my backyard is uh, are listed here for you. And there's different nurseries that are native plant growers and they're very proud to, to be able to promote that. And they can tell you exactly where their seed source comes from, which is important. The Grow Me Instead Guide for Southern Ontario, super, super helpful. Uh, right now they're not shipping out copies of their current edition, but you can find it online. Uh, the Native Plant Resource Guide shows you all over, uh, basically it's, it's uh, chapter specific, but it shows you native plants for all over the place and you can pick your region. And the Invasive Species Center, this is just a generic link to their main page, but they include so many different invasive species and how to manage them. And uh, these have all been great resources for myself. And obviously this is not a, an extensive list, but it is a great starting point uh, for, for resources that the average homeowner can use to begin their journey in their backyard. So we had some questions that were posed to us in advance of our, uh, of, of our webinar. And I'm gonna turn it over to Brian to, to cover some of these, these questions here. Yeah, th thanks Lindsay. So, uh... Is English ivy considered an invasive plant? Um, yes, it is. It's a very invasive plant. Um, I think we talked about that in the invasive species section. So um, most of our invasive species, they either came over with the European settlers um, back when people were coming to this country or they're um, from the Asian countries. Um, so the China and, and Japan. Um, so that's basically how they got here. Um, next question is, is perennial geranium considered native or invasive? So there are some cultivated geraniums um, that are non-native to Ontario, but in general, geraniums are not really considered invasive. Um, there's actually four levels of invasive species. Um, it goes from level one to level four. Um, so certain plants, are, they're, they're put in those levels by how invasive they actually are. <laughs> um, so something like a dandelion, for instance, it's, it's non-native to Ontario. It's not really that invasive, but so it, it would be like a level level four invasive. Um, I mean, level one is your highest level, and that's where you get your buckthorn, your garlic mustard, um, um, dog strangling vine. So. Um, just some knowledge, right? So like, even though a plant's non-native, it might generally not be invasive. Um, so there's the next question. We're talking about dandelions. Um, so dandelions, they are considered a, like a low level invasive plant. Although people will say they're invasive in their yard, which um, that's true, that's true. Um, it's funny though, because in natural environments, 
you don't really see dandelions out competing other species. So um, they really do well in yards though. So. Uh, black locust trees, are they invasive or natives? Um, black locusts are um, non-native and they are invasive. Um, they really take over an area. If you ever see a black locust in seed, um, there's a lot of seeds there um, in, in those pods. There is a, a native locust, it's called the honey locust. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful tree. Um, so if you wanna take down your black locust trees, replace them with honey locust. Um, is the blackberry bush considered invasive? Uh, no, blackberries, um, they're in the, the um, bramble um, genus. So they're there with raspberries, um, purple raspberry bush. Those are all really good plants. Um, they're great for pollinators. Um, and they're a great food source for our, our native species and for us as well. I mean, everyone, if you're ever hiking and you see a blackberry bush or, or a raspberry bush and you pick a couple of those berries, um, they're very delicious. So I think we have some more questions. The questions on native plants. So what are good native species to plant in a shady, relatively dry area of your yard? Um, so. When people ask me about what native species to plant, I like to tell them, you know what, go, go take a hike. Go, go take a hike on the Bruce Trail. And when you're in, when you're, if you have a shady spot in your yard, go for a walk in the bush, in a local park on the Bruce Trail, and see what's, what's growing under the shade of those trees. Because that'll give you a real good idea of what's gonna grow in, in your yard. Even though, you know, some of the soil um, characteristics might be different. Um, you, you're, you're still, if, if you've got a choke cherry growing in your local forest, and you, you're pretty good chance you can buy a choke cherry from the nursery and it's going to grow in your yard. So that's always my, um, my advice. But there's, there's a couple of examples there. For shrubs, you can plant some dogwoods, choke cherry. Leatherwood is a really nice shrub, and bush honeysuckle. They're all pretty hardy, hardy shrubs as well. So with flowers, you know, you got, you got your trilliums, trout lilies. Yellow lady slippers are uh, a very hardy orchid. So, you know, if you if you if you love orchids, um, and you can get a yellow lady slipper at a at a nursery, they'll grow pretty much anywhere. I mean, I've seen them growing in deep forests. I've seen them growing in on the side side of the road in a ditch. So um, they're pretty hardy plants. So the next question is a beginner of native gardening. What plants do you recommend? So once again, if you're up wherever you are, this person was up in Owen Sound, you know, take a walk on the Bruce Trail, see what's growing there. Um, get some good, going down to the next question. It's always good to get some, some good books or resources on your local species. Um, so get those books, learn what you're looking at when you're hiking, and that way you can identify the native species and then transfer, not transfer those, but um, use those species in your home gardens. So some good books. I personally use the Peterson um, Field Guide for Plants and the uh, Newcombs. There's also a good series called uh, Lone Pine and they do all kinds of, uh, um, they have native flowers of Eastern North America. They have uh, birds of Eastern North America. So really good resource. There's the Shrubs of Ontario book, which is another very good resource. Most of these you can find uh, at your local bookstore. Um, if you're up in the Northern areas, the Owen Sound Field Naturalists have a great um, series of books. They have one specific to the orchids of Bruce and Gray County. They have one specific to the ferns of uh, Bruce and Gray County. Um, great, great resource. So next questions on plant control. <clears throat> Any advice for eco-friendly weed control? So they don't want to spray toxic chemical. Um, there really is no a homemade remedy for um, making your own weed killer. Um, some people have used vinegar and water. 
we've actually we actually did an experiment on uh, um, different types of home remedies, and it's none of them really worked. So I'm going to say there really isn't any that I know of that really work really well. So a whole bunch of questions here. So we're going to, yeah, how can you, basically when it comes to invasive species, the best option is, is to pull it. Just pull it out, make sure you get the roots, um, dig it out if you have to. Um, just getting that entire plant out of there is, is uh, the, the best best way to get rid of these. Um, some some species you can cut them. If you have a weed whacker or a lawnmower, you can just keep cutting over them. Um, the big thing is don't let them go to flower or seed. <clears throat> Once that happens, they'll just spread more. So so yeah, pull it, cut it, or cover it up and let the sun do its work to um, to basically bake them, and then uh, get them out of there and replant native stuff. So one note is we don't really recommend um, the use of toxic herbicides to, you know, to kill invasive species. Um, for us in our work, we try to avoid them at, at all costs. Um, but sometimes the, the, the sheer volume of invasive species just cannot be done by pulling it or covering it. So, um, the BTC ecologists, and we're licensed pesticide applicators, so we've had training, we've taken the test, we know what we're doing. Um, so when it comes to, to those large populations, we really um, very carefully don the use of pesticides. So. Um, so I've seen that we've had a couple of questions pop up in our Q&A. And I'm hoping that Michael McDonald has had a chance to uh, review those for us and can hopefully throw a few our way and we'll do our best to answer them. Okay, great. Uh, so firstly, Brian and Lindsay, that was absolutely fantastic. I learned a great deal and, and a great, great job there. Just absolutely tremendous. Uh, we do have a few questions. Um, I'll start off with the first one and is how prevalent is Japanese knotwood in Southern Ontario? My neighbor gave me some a few years ago, and I've thankfully been able to eradicate it over three years ago. So I'm wondering, uh, Brian, Lindsay, can you talk about Japanese knotweed? Sure. Brian, go for it. <laughs> yeah, the uh, Japanese knotweed is—it's—it's it's up there with giant hogweed, in my opinion. It's one of the worst plants. Um, it's not dangerous, but it's dangerous to your house. Um, the roots of this plant can actually grow through concrete. So if you plant it beside your house, it can actually destroy your foundation. And there, there's a, I've, I've actually seen it. Um, it's a really tough, tough plant. Um, it's, it is like all invasive species, unfortunately, it's slowly spreading um, and it's spreading further north. Um, I see it more often down, down in Southern Ontario, um, but there's, there's huge patches up in the Blue Mountains section that we've actually, the BTC ecologists have actually started to, to help treat. It's not, it's not on a Bruce Trail property, but we're, um, we're trying to help, uh, help a neighbor get rid of it. It's, it's a horrible plant. It takes over. Um, I've actually seen it up near Owen Sound as well. It's, there's a huge patch up there. So it's like everything, as climate change happens, um, things get warmer, invasive species start to get further and further north. So. Okay, Th thanks, Brian. And, and that's a great segue for the next question, which is uh, from Richard Smythe. And it says, are there considerations for climate change and regionally native species? Yeah, we're so, always considering um, climate change. Uh, right now, climate change, a lot of people don't, we don't really know, we, we know what's happening, but we don't know what the effects of it are gonna be on our native species. We have some, some general ideas. Um, but that's just, as, as that knowledge um, grows, then we'll be able to have a better, you know, better handle on, on how we can handle the, the climate change question. Okay, great. Thank you. I've got a question from Zuni Sullivan that says, do the four levels of invasive species have names? 
Yep, level one, level two, level three, and level four. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that, Brian. Um, I've got a question from Sheila Kingsborough. It says, monarch butterflies lay their eggs on dog strangling vine, which is an invasive vine. I'm sure there are other non-invasive plants that monarchs lay their eggs on, but if we are pulling out dog strangling vine, would it be better at a certain time to pull them out so we don't disturb the eggs? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, see, the thing is, when the, when the eggs hatch, they won't survive. The, the larva um, just, they don't feed uh, on the dog strangling vine and it doesn't provide that nourishment. So unless we actually pick the little caterpillars off and put them on a milkweed, that that's the only way you, that you would save the, the caterpillars. And that would be a crazy huge job to do <laughs> is to walk through a patch of dog strangling vine. But if there is the odd chance, that one's going to fall off and end up on a common milkweed that's nearby, then yeah, I mean, you, you want to do your, your invasive species removal in the, in the spring, um, up to like June, because the, the monarchs don't lay their, their eggs till a little bit later. So. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. I've got a great question here from Suzanne. It says, what is the best way to get rid of poison ivy? <laughs> Goats. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, that's that, that's a tough question because as, as a BTC ecologist, we try not we don't remove poison ivy because it's a native species, and even though a lot of people don't like it, um, it's a huge contributor to our our our, uh, our biodiversity. Uh, a lot of things eat the eat the the berries. Um, it just makes us itchy, which is unfortunate. Um, if on the Bruce Trail itself, if we have some issues with it, we will cut it back. Um, but there really isn't anything like we've, we have in certain cases tried to use the pesticide and it, it doesn't work. It'll kill it for maybe three weeks and you go back in three weeks and that poison ivy has grown right back. So um, the only way to do it would be put some gloves on and dig it out. Right. And then, uh, get rid of it that way but don't don't ever burn poison ivy <laughs> like I've, I've seen people put it on on a fire like dig it out and burn it um if you get those that smoke in your eyes it, it can actually do some harm okay all right great advice thank you brian uh i've got two more questions one is uh from ruth moffett hello ruth and it says can you please comment on bamboo lindsay <laughs> uh, well, obviously, uh, I'm not sure in what regard, but bamboo is obviously not native to to Ontario, so um, I can't comment on its invasive uh, nature. Um, now, if we're talking bamboo in regards to sustainable furniture and sustainable um, product and wood product, I'm all for that regard. Um, but the I know Japanese knotweed looks a lot like bamboo, um, but as, as Brian mentioned, it's, it's hugely detrimental. Um, bamboo does grow quickly, so I'm assuming that if you're speaking about planting bamboo in southern Ontario, probably not uh, the first choice since it is not at all native to the area. Right. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. And, and someone's commented saying Japanese knotwood is often referred to as bamboo, so again, it might be a, a nomenclature thing there. Yeah, um, it does, we've got time for knotweed does look like it uh, because it has the the stem and then the nodes and then the next one. Um, so it does look like it, but uh, it's it's not got the same properties that bamboo does. So you're not going to be able to harvest that and use that as a wood product. Okay, great. So um, and I've got two last questions and these will be the, the last two. But one is, is asjuga okay as a ground cover and grass replacement? Yeah, um, that it's, it's a non-native um, plant. Um, but as long as it's not invasive, like that's the thing you, you can, you can use non-native plants. Like don't, <laughs> we're not, we're not telling you, you can't ever use a non-native plant for your garden. Um, you, you just got to make sure it's not invasive. So that, that plant in particular, it's probably like a level three invasive. So it, it's, if it gets into a natural habitat, it doesn't really become invasive. 
but it'll take over your yard. Um, so, yeah, but once again, I, I would recommend get like a, a native species. Um, bearberry, for instance, is, is a good ground cover. It's like a, it's almost like a little shrub, but it only gets like an inch high. Um, wintergreen is a, is a really good ground cover. Um, so there, there are native species that you can um, kind of go back to for, uh, you know, for different areas of your yard. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. And then this will be our last question for today. And uh, it's uh, from Ann McConical. And it says, I have a large native meadow planting. And over the years, non-natives have come in via winter birds. It's very hard to find or pull them before they go to seed. And since they're intertwined with the desirable plants, what to do? I particularly have a problem with rough chinkafoil. Yeah, well, the, yeah, that's the, when it comes to um, like a tall grass prairie or like a, like a, a native wildflower garden, you're, you're always going to get the non-natives are always going to move in. And it's going to be really hard to eradicate all of them. Um, the hope is, is that the native species, once they establish themselves, they will either outcompete or um, kind of compete alongside the non-native species. Um, they, once again, the, the best way to do it is to walk through it and try to get try to get them when they are not in, into seed. Um, if they're if they're in flower, you should be able to recognize them at that stage, and and maybe pull them out then. But um, it's pretty tough to get rid of every non-native species just because the birds are going to keep coming, the insects are going to keep coming with uh, maybe some seeds on it. You know, the deer are going to walk through and poop in your tall grass prairie and drop seeds. So <laughs> um, you just got to hopefully that the, the native species will uh, live along the non-native species and uh, um, survive. So. Okay, great. So, so thanks for all those wonderful questions. You can see on the screen that um, if you have any more, you feel free to reach out to Lindsay directly and she'll do her best to, uh, to answer and work with Brian and uh, Adam or other ecologists to get back to you. Um, in closing, I really want to thank Brian and Lindsay for their hard work and expertise today. That was absolutely fantastic. And we're so lucky to have such talented people at the BTC. So thanks for a really great job today. I also want to thank um, Jackie Randall and Megan Kroll, who you can't see right now, but behind the scenes have been hosting this webinar and making it all happen from sort of behind the curtain. So thanks to both of you for putting this series together. And, and just lastly, I want to end with a great big thank you to all of you that attended today. I really want to thank every single one of you for your continued support of our mission. We need your continued support and we look forward to seeing you all again on the trail as soon as it's safe to do so. So please, Stay healthy, stay well, and take care. Until next time, thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.